it's right now we're going to take a moment just to talk in general about neurological disorders. And that would include things like ADD, ADHD, learning disorders, autism, OCD, et cetera. So all disorders seem to involve the cerebellum, the thalamus, the basal ganglia, and the prefrontal cortex. And remember that there are connections from the cerebellum through the um, thalamus and the basal ganglia to the prefrontal cortex. That's, um, and what happens is this uh, information is relayed up and it's relayed back, and it just this um, it goes back and forth. But when there is an issue, cerebellum's not fully developed. Well, then it's not going to be linked well with the limbic system and the prefrontal cortex. If the problems with um, in the basal ganglia or the thalamus, then the there's it's not going to be able to connect up to the prefrontal cortex. Um, Problem, you know, so all of this has to be, um, all of those parts have to be developed well, and then they have to be connected. Um, anytime you ask a child to do something and they cannot do it, then it's a frontal lobe problem because the frontal lobe is what would like on purposely like try to initiate something. In fact, that would probably be like more of a left frontal lobe problem. Um, if the child is unable to stop something, it would be more of a right frontal lobe issue. We'll talk about left and right um, in another video. The frontal lobe governs the um, automaticity of the emotions and gives control. So the, um, you know, babies when, or when children when they're two and they, um, the limbic system is just developing and they, you know, they're, they get, you know, they have their uh, tantrums or whatever, they start crying um, out of control. Their front, they don't have a frontal lobe to kind of you know, talk them out of that. But as we mature and we develop and our frontal lobe starts to take over and say, oh, okay, well, it's not that bad. We don't really need to react in that way. If we look at ADHD, ADHD, um, there's a huge component in the basal ganglia and the basal ganglia is responsible for ability to move in the gravitational field. It controls our postural reflexes. Its uh, job is to inhibit movement and it's more at, most active when we're still. So again, I think we mentioned before briefly, but the the whole the role of the basal ganglia is to um, it helps to integrate the primitive reflexes. So the primitive reflexes are controlled by the brainstem. Um, so as we get stimulation, the basal ganglia starts to integrate that and turn those into more um, complex movement and um, our postural reflexes or the reflexes that we have as adults that we will still have as adults that we need as adults. Um, if when the basal ganglia is functioning properly its job is to inhibit movement. So if if the basal ganglia is on then it's telling the movement to stop. So children who are able to sit still in class have a a very nice active basal ganglia. Students who cannot, for the life of them, sit still have a problem in the area of their basal ganglia. The basal ganglia can be underdeveloped from either a lack of sensory input um, and unintegrated reflexes. So if the reflexes are unintegrated, then the basal ganglia is not developed, or from inflammation, immune activity, food sensitivities, um, etc. So like we said with the cerebellum, how that gluten can directly attack the cerebellum, um, we have things that can directly attack the basal ganglia because it's metabolically very active. So for example, PANDAS is a um, disorder that they have autism-like symptoms, but they start right after a strep type infection. So the uh, virus has attacked the basal ganglia. When the basal ganglia is an, in an elderly person, when the basal ganglia cells start to die, the postural reflexes start to go away, the primitive reflexes come back out, and then we, um, and then they also can start to have Parkinson's. So, um, so elderly people, you know, like when we uh, move forward, it the re our postural reflexes then to walk. But maybe in an elderly person, when they move, uh, lean forward, they might fall down. So um, as the cells of the basal ganglia die, then we, it kind of reverses itself. So as babies, we have our primitive reflexes in the brainstem. We 
use sensory stimulation specific movements to help integrate that. The basal ganglia is in charge of integrating that and then controlling our postural reflexes and, um, and then inhibiting movement. So again, if we um, people in Parkinson's, they have the tremors, their basal ganglia is not, no longer able to inhibit those um, unwanted movements of their body. In um, autism, we have, there's something that, um, that is interesting to note, that there's an undeveloped, um, well, the insular cortex is, if you see in the picture, when they kind of move away like that top layer of the cortex, there's another layer, and that's called the underneath called the insular cortex. And on the right side, this picture looks like it's on the left, but if it were on the right side, um, they, uh, it's noted that there's an undeveloped insular cortex on the right. This area is where the sm a sense of smell, taste, emotional touch, nonverbal communication, immune suppression, gut regulation, digestion, intuition, those gut feelings, subconscious awareness, vestibular, spatial sense, mirror neuron functions, nonverbal communication, and emotional awareness in self and others all converge in this one area on the right side called in, in the insular cortex, which is basically all the um, signs of um, or the symptoms or classical um, symptoms of autism. So what is being said is that this area, there's inflammation in this area of the brain. Also in autism, ADD and ADHD, there's the problem in the vermis area of the cerebellum. So we have um, the cerebellum, we have this that green strip, obviously it's not really green, but that green strip is right in the middle. And um, that is the part that seems to be affected in um, autism, ADD, and ADHD. And the cerebellum, like the brain, the cerebellum develops from the inside out. So that inner layer is, um, uh, developed first, I guess I should say. And um, it's in control of posture and um, eye tracking. So, um, and the problem is, for, for that part to develop, it's a lack of sensory input and vestibular input. Also, the inferior olive, which is like behind the cerebellum, is um, affected and that affects the slower processing speed. So oftentimes, you know, kids uh, with ADD, ADHD, and autism um, have, are their poor pro uh, language processors, um, so they, that's why they have a hard time around language. Um, the deficit between processing of the inferior olive cerebellum, thalamus, and cortex. So in general, there's just, uh, they have processing issues and they have um, these areas that we talked about in other slides are just undeveloped. So we know that besides ADD, ADHD, and autism, there's a myriad of other um, neurological disorders. Um, some, for example, OCD, Tourette's, um, and they have to do with um, the connections to the, the pathways um, to the basal ganglia and other parts of the brain. Um, so the basal ganglia, for example, there's two pathways um, that go from the frontal cortex to the basal ganglia. One um, activates and one inhibits. And so when one of the pathways is kind of stuck, um, it's like stuck in this uh, like position where the movement just keeps going and going and going. Um, and you know, if you notice that if someone who has tics, if they're not, um, it's activated when, when they're kind of stressed. Um, so the, the loop, um, the pathway is going a lot faster. So when the person is calmer and the, um, the loop that inhibits, um, that's more activated and then um, the tics are lessened. And OCD is kind of the same thing. I mean, it's um, not a movement disorder, but it is a mental disorder. So some of the loops um, on the left side of the brain are gonna be much more activated than the loops on the right side. So people with OCD is very connected to like ADHD and autism. They're more left strong. And we'll talk about hemispheric differences later. Um, but just, I wanted to give a little due diligence to, you know, other types of uh, uh, disabilities. And speaking of that, so if we're looking at learning disabilities, um, learning disabilities are um, deficits in the left. So if we had things like, um, uh, you know, autism and ADHD, those are more deficits in the right um, hemisphere, which uh, again, we'll talk about later, but learning disabilities such as dyslexia, dysgraphia, dyscalculia, and calculia, um, those are def deficits in the left um, hemisphere. Um, they're specific areas on the left side that's for 
um, phonemic awareness for calculations. Um, and so uh, those are more deficits on the uh, left side. So um, in working memory and then auditory and visual processing, that's um, a little bit more just with both sides of the brain being able to work together. Um, kids who struggle with the behavior side, we, um, you know, uh, maybe they're more like left brain. So maybe they're um, not struggling so much academically. Sometimes they are. Um, but the kids oftentimes who are struggling um, academically are not necessarily struggling behaviorally and they're really trying. And, and, um, and so the kids um, that struggle uh, academically, we tend to notice right away in school because why? Because, well, they have to know how to read. They have to be able to write. And um, so school's a very left brain um, activity. And uh, those who are struggling with the social, some of the other right hemisphere, let's say if the autism isn't um, associated with a very severe behavior, some of the kids, um, you know, that kind of more quote unquote high functioning or the Asperger's or whatever, they can get missed through school because they actually do really well in school. And so that social component maybe is missed because maybe teachers aren't noticing the playground behavior or, or what have you. Um, so anyway, so, there are many different kinds of uh, uh, disabilities. So the bottom line is that all disabilities are problems with networks that are underdeveloped, underintegrated, and underregulated. And again, they one problem is the lack of sensory input, but the other problem is is that maybe the child is unable to. Um, to register that input because of inflammation, chronic inflammation of the brain, food sensitivities, um, immune dysregulation. Um, so we have a two-part problem. So the disability is a problem with the, the networks not being developed. And the way that we need to tackle that is we need to look at integrating the primitive reflexes. We need to um, provide more sensory input, um, provide more specified uh, movements through rhythmic movements, um, but on the other hand, too, we have to make sure that the inflammation that we're dealing with the inflammation, we're removing the food sensitivities, we are um, we're uh, balancing out the immune system, and um, removing all the the metabolic stressors to the body.